Hey everybody, hope you guys are having a good day so far. Just about to get started on our um, intro to philosophy lecture here. First first meeting, lecture meeting, so welcome everybody who's filing in. Be right with you guys once 5.30 comes. Just get my notes set up here. Thanks. Thanks, Dewey. Yeah, she's really cute. Peachy. Princess Peach. Peachy. She's a really good girl. Good evening. What's up, Peachy? <clears throat> yeah, she's like um, her and her brother. They're not even five months old. They were um, they were born what March 29th. Hey there, AJ. How's it going? <clears throat> good evening. Nice to see you guys. Good to have. Little interaction during this COVID world. <clears throat> and then you guys have seen the other kitty too, right? Eddie. This is her brother. Big boy, big Eddie. Yeah. What's up? What's up, bro? Big Eddie. Yeah. Yeah, these cats are the best. <clears throat> so yeah, a few more minutes till it's five thirty. Thanks. Yeah, they're um, they're still so young, just really playful. So, I'm still getting used to having them with the Zoom because I only got them in the summer. They'll interrupt the meetings once in a while, but yeah, they're just they're the best. Really, really cute. Good evening. Do they do tricks? Well, I'll tell you this. Eddie plays fetch for sure. Like I could throw a ball anywhere, and he runs, brings it back to me, drops it right at my feet. So is that a trick? I don't know, but it's pretty cool. <clears throat> yeah, he's, he's really smart. Just I don't know. Never had a cat that would actually do that. <clears throat> They keep each other company. They're always running around. Hmm. Brother. Okay, I'm going to quickly just make sure to remind our, our class one last time about the uh, meeting. So I'm going to send out a quick reminder. Waiting for 5:30. Once, once 5:30 comes, just give everyone a chance to arrive to the, to the live stream, and then I'll just go right into our uh, our notes and topic for today. <clears throat> I've noticed that a lot of times the numbers all kind of swell up right at the last minute. So it seems like it's happening now. Looking at the number of participants here. <clears throat> yes, it will be saved, AJ. The whole thing is going to be saved and 
permanently archived here on the channel, so you will not have to worry at all. <clears throat> Anything that glitches out on your end, you can watch it um, when you have a better connection later, for sure. No problem. <clears throat> Cool, almost ready. Okay guys, thanks so much for being here. It's 5.30 now. Hi Brooklyn um, and to all the others. Feel free you guys to um, say hi over there in the chat. As you should know, this is YouTube Live and um, we can interact in real time through the live chat. I'm seeing all your comments. And um, so during the lecture, if there's ever a comment, question, or clarification, anything you need or would like to add, feel free to go ahead and uh, toss in a comment, and I'll notice it there in the chat and reply to you guys. But yeah, feel free to say hi, test out the chat format one time, um, and also I'll see all who's here. Um, but yeah, I appreciate you guys being here tonight as we start off our semester and jump into these topics for intro to philosophy. Good evening, one and all. Um, the question, no longer Zoom? Yeah, no longer Zoom, YouTube Live. Um, I'll go back to Zoom for office hours. I'll use Zoom for maybe select meetings at different times throughout the semester. But I'm gonna, I will use both platforms, but for the most part, I prefer YouTube Live. In my mind, having had some success with it already in the spring, um, it provides, in some cases, fewer distractions. People's microphones and cameras can get switched on inadvertently. People can zoom bomb and like fill the uh, the meeting with a bunch of trash and you know random stuff. So um, I like it this way. But when people do want to have face-to-face -face meetings, I, I you know I have the alternative of Zoom for those meetings. But anyway, any questions that ever come up or anything that's ever on your mind, feel free to just drop it in the chat and um, and I'll see you right there. Okay guys, so let me uh, just get us started then. This is the class of Intro to Philosophy, and we have a bunch of different interesting major topics in philosophy that we're gonna examine. Um, the first main topic in this class is about religion and belief. Okay, so that's our major topic, philosophy of religion. Okay, so, <clears throat> by the way, quick question. Don't worry about role, Kevin. Why are you trying to snitch on all these students? No, I'm just kidding. It, I'm not taking role. Okay, so philosophy of religion. Does anybody know what the word uh, philosophy means if you break down the etymology of the word? What do you think? Has anyone heard of this? It, it does have like a original Greek derivation if you go way back in time. Anybody heard about that? Let's see if you got something for me. Not the study of thought, not to think, although those are fair and reasonable uh, guesses to start. Not thinking, hmm, it's, it's in the ballpark of that. Let me help you out a little bit. Okay, so hmm, the first part of the word It kind of breaks down into two roots. The first part comes from the Greek word philia, which means to love. So like if you've ever heard words like um, audiophile, lover of sound, bibliophile, lover of books, the term file is derived from the Greek word meaning to love. So philia, the first part is to love. The second part is from the Greek word sophia, which nowadays is usually just like a, a nice name, but originally that word from Greek means wisdom. Okay, so if philia is to love and Sophia is wisdom, then philosophy is the love of wisdom. And a philosopher is a lover of wisdom. So that's really the topic of philosophy. It's, it's um, deep investigation 
into questions concerning the human condition and the nature of reality. We're trying to gain wisdom and pursue it because we love it. Um, and that's, I think, interesting because like a lot of other academic subjects, they have a, a derivation that breaks down into the logos of something, which is the logic of it, biology, the logic of living things. Um, philosophy is in a way different because it's got this kind of passionate pursuit of wisdom that's done through the attitude of love, like lying right at the heart of the subject matter. So in philosophy, we attempt to pursue deep questions of human concern and interest. Um, and that's why we call ourselves lovers of wisdom. So we allow ourselves in philosophy to investigate questions of almost indefinite variety. We're interested in the deep puzzling mysteries of existence, religion, our place in the universe, um, and etc. So among the topics that philosophers uh, investigate and analyze is the question of religion. So the philosophy of religion is the first major branch of philosophy that we're all looking at. Now, in the philosophy of religion, what we try to do is to examine religious beliefs, their basis, and to clarify them. Philosophers and everyday people, when it comes to um, religion, can be one of three possible categories. Okay, so let me write down what are three positions that people can hold on the topic of religion and God. Okay, so three positions on the existence of God. Some of you may already be somewhat familiar with these terms, but we're going to make sure that it's clear to all. So one viewpoint is called uh, theism. Now, what do you think is a theist? Uh, or what? So theist would be a person who adheres to this way of thinking. Theism is the name of the... Um, the perspective itself, just like Buddhism is a school of thought and a Buddhist is an individual who follows that school of thought. So, right, theism is to believe in God. Maybe to make it less abstract, I'll define it in terms of it being one of the practitioners. So, theist, a person who believes in God. So theism is the position, the belief that God exists, okay? On the other hand, though, not 100% of people are theists. There's um, a significant minority of people who are on the opposite side. So atheism is the opposite, right? And what is an atheist? An atheist is a person who does not believe in God, okay? So they lack the belief in God. A, the prefix, serves as like a negation, Um so, not a theist. Okay, so atheist is the contrary. Maybe the person is convinced there's no God at all. Um, maybe they just lack the belief in God. A third possible position that sometimes people discuss is often referred to as agnosticism or the agnostic. Any thoughts on what is an agnostic? That's a term that some people have heard of, but other people might be a little fuzzy on it. Um, I don't know. Even if you had a guess, it doesn't matter if it's really correct. Indifferent, that's a good, uh, I think, basic idea of it. It's... It's a person who neither affirms nor denies, basically. So it's often thought of as like a middle intermediate position. So they neither say they believe, nor do they claim there's no God. They essentially say, I'm taking no position. And why? Because often they'll claim there's not good enough evidence um, to compel them either way. Okay, so the agnostic is a person who suspends judgment because they think there's um, not enough proof. <clears throat> a person... who suspends judgment, meaning they don't take a position.
person who suspends judgment because of a perceived lack of evidence. Now, I'm going to write that in the chat because I know it's a little crammed on the bottom. So I'm going to type in the definition of agnostic also, but I'll write it up on here. So a person who suspends judgment because of uh, perceived lack of evidence. Okay, and I'll just add that to the chat. Okay. Yeah, so these are three positions, and every single person's in one of these three camps. Now, to be a theist, the first viewpoint there is uh, compatible with being a member of different possible religions. You know, so some theists, as we know, are Christian theists. Some theists, uh, Jewish theists or Muslim. Um, even though the particular doctrines of those various religions, of course, differ, and the manner of observance of those religions, of course, is different, they share. They, they kind of join hands on the position that there's a supernatural creator of the universe, God, that, that rules everything, right? So theism is a broader concept than a specific religious denomination or another. It's the bigger idea that there's just some God that exists. And then atheism is the denial of the existence of God. Agnosticism is a person who is uncommitted um, either way because they think evidence is not yet there to make the case for or against in a, in a substantial way. So yeah, um, we are going to examine the positions of philosophers who've made arguments for all of those views. So we're gonna basically take the best arguments from the whole history of philosophy for the case that God does exist. We're also going to examine some arguments given by atheist philosophers to either claim there's no God or to just criticize the arguments that God exists. So as is a hallmark of philosophical writing, um, we are going to examine arguments from across the spectrum of uh, opinion and, and uh, rational thought. So the first couple of weeks of the class are gonna be spent on some of the most famous arguments that God does exist. So we're gonna examine arguments that have been written by theists throughout the centuries, throughout the millennia, and we're also going to take a look at the objections to those arguments. In a way, philosophy can almost remind you in, in an abstract sense of uh, the practice of law. And that's probably why many people who enter the legal profession have had some studies in philosophy or logic earlier in their academic career. Because um, in philosophy, we consider arguments on either side of a position. You know, one person says God exists, and the other person says, here's my counter argument. Uh, we could consider arguments in ethics. One person says, you have a moral obligation to assist the poor. And another philosopher says, no, for reasons I'll uh, articulate, we don't have that obligation. So it's all about conceptual argument and rational defense of your claim. And that's something that is in common with law, because in law you go into a courtroom and maybe you're making a case in favor of guilt, or you're making a case against the prosecuting attorney for the case of innocence. So being able to present a case for a conclusion that's reasonable to a you know, rational person um, is is a distinctive skill that you develop in philosophy. And so even though we're training those tools on a very abstract question of the existence of God, the same methods of rational criticism and um, argument can be deployed anywhere in life, okay? So yeah, let's get started then with the first author and the first argument about God's existence. And this is gonna be our main um, focus for this meeting and then next meeting. We start with a man whose name is St. Anselm, and his argument is a classic in philosophy, trying to prove that God exists, okay? Okay. So here's the man's name, St. Anselm. 
All right, and let me give you a little bit of facts about Anselm's life. He lived from 1033 until um, 1109. So his life spanned from the mid 11th into the early 12th century. He lived about, I mean, he was born around a thousand years ago. It's 2020, so he was born in 1033. Um, he lived in the medieval period of Western history, and uh, he was the Archbishop of Canterbury. So he was actually a learned figure and a well-known church scholar in his life. Later on, he was um, ordained a saint in the Christian church, now the Catholic church. This is prior to the Protestant Reformation and the breakdown of the church into Protestantism and Catholicism. So anyway, he is a very well-known church figure, canonized as a saint. And he wrote an important book in the year 1077. So in 1077, he published a book which was called The Proslogion. Okay, the Proslogion is a book he wrote in 1077, and within that book, he presents an argument for God's existence that we are now going to all try to study and learn about. And the name of that argument is called the Ontological Argument. So right here is the name of the major argument for God's existence that we are now going to try and analyze and break down. The ontological argument by St. Anselm, um, Archbishop of Canterbury from 1077 from his book, The Proslogion. The word ontological is a bit of a mouthful. It's not a word that we probably have ever used, uh, but just so you know its meaning, it also derives from Greek, ontos having to do with being or existence. So it's an argument that's trying to establish that God exists just based on the nature of what type of being he is believed to be, you know? So we're trying to form an argument for God's existence just based on the idea of God, basically. Okay, so before I dive into more specific details of the argument, I want to make one point, that this is an argument that is not based on empirical evidence. It's not based on any uh, empirical type of evidence. Does anybody have a sense of what the word empirical evidence means? Let me put it in the chat really quick so that you see the word spelled. Anybody familiar with the term empirical evidence? What kind of evidence is it if it's empirical evidence? Have a thought on that? It doesn't really matter to me if you look it up or anything else, but if you have it off common knowledge, that's great. Um, AJ, you say statistics? Well, statistics could be one kind of empirical evidence. Um, you're saying no numbers to show? Not Well, it's not necessarily about the presence or absence of numbers. Um, I see you guys saying experience, and that's a little closer, yes. Experiment. All of that is the ballpark of truth. Based on factual evidence, Anne, okay. Rachel, you're saying observation. This is all pretty much on the mark. Let me just add to your uh, comments by saying this. Empirical evidence is essentially evidence that can be observed with the five senses. So it's evidence that is based on things that you can observe by either sight, taste, touch, hearing, or smell. So you can think of it as like physical evidence, right? Now, reminding you, this argument is not based on empirical evidence. It's based on ideas and concepts only. So it's not based on anything that you could see, taste, touch, hear, or smell. Let me give you an example of what one case of empirical evidence could be. So is there evidence that dinosaurs existed? Yes. What's the evidence? What reason do we have to think that there was ever dinosaurs? Now you can tell me that. <clears throat> There's evidence. It's not just, yeah, big fossils, right? So is that empirical evidence? Yes, it is. It's empirical evidence because it's a physical object that's been excavated from some archaeological site some dig, and it's been carbon dated, and therefore we have really solid physical evidence to establish the existence of the dinosaurs. Um, a lot of scientific evidence is based on empirical data, things that be, can be collected in the field, measured and observed, right? 
So like we think that the uh, universe is in a state of constant expansion outward because we can observe the growing distances between objects when we use like these super powerful telescopes. That observational data is empirical evidence for that conclusion. Now, I'm telling you again, the ontological argument from Anselm is not at all about empirical evidence. So it's not like he says, let me give you this argument that God exists. Look through a microscope at this little, uh, you know, mineral that I found somewhere, and there you're going to see the evidence of God. No. So it's not based on anything that you could tangibly interact with in a physical or observational sense. It's merely based on concepts and ideas alone. Which you may think, does that make it a bad argument? Not necessarily. There's a lot of very powerful arguments that are merely derived from uh, concepts, conceptual arguments. And that's what this one is. So just remind you where we've been so far in the meeting. I like to do intermittent uh, summary as we go through it. First of all, we're talking about the philosophy of religion. Philosophy is the love of wisdom. It can pursue topics on, on any number of cases, any number of interesting subjects. Uh, there's three main positions in religion and on the question of God. Some are theists. They believe God exists. Some are atheists. Uh, those are those that don't think so. And then there are agnostics who take neither side because they think there's no good evidence, or not enough anyway, to prove one way or the other. We're looking at examining arguments for God's existence by some of the best theist philosophers over the generations. And now we're studying and looking at the work of St. Anselm and the ontological argument from his book, Proslogion. The ontological argument, which now we're going to really investigate in more depth, is not based on empirical evidence. So it's not based on observational or physical data. Okay, so what is it based on? It's based on ideas and concepts in the mind. And the first thing that the author says when he starts his discussion in the book is... He asks, uh, what is God believed to be? Like, what kind of being is God basically believed to be, right? So we're going to ask those questions now together in this meeting. What are the qualities that are typically associated with the being of God? So qualities or attributes of God. Now, um, you, don't have, you don't have to necessarily be a believer in God to know what some of these qualities are presumed to be. Uh, whether you believe in God or not, I think we all at least have some kind of working understanding of what uh, basically that being is supposed to be like. So let's see what you guys have in mind here. While you're coming up with some of those items on the list, I just quickly am going to reach and grab my uh, MacBook charger. I'm at about 25%. I think I'll make it through the meeting, but I don't want to take a chance. So I'll be right back so I can plug it in. One sec. Okay. Cool. So back to the discussion. Um, all right, so I already see some really good examples from you guys. Brooklyn, starting with your comment, all-powerful. Yes. Has anyone ever heard the, the sort of philosophical-sounding fancy word that stands for all-powerful? Anybody know what that word is? Om-something is a hint. Omnipotent. I actually see it in the chat. Good, Cameron. Okay, yeah. So one quality is omnipotence. And omnipotent means all-powerful. Potent has to do with power. Omni means all. So all-powerful. Yeah, God is thought of as a being which is powerful, but not just to some degree powerful, to an infinite, unlimited degree. It's supposed to be thought that with respect to God, his power is infinite and unlimited, that there's nothing whatsoever that God couldn't do simply through an act of will. So God's presumed to have unlimited power. I also see all-knowing. Yes. And uh, I see that some of you have noted that the word uh, all-knowing is the term omniscient. Good. Omniscient. All-knowing.
Once again, as we're thinking about etymology a little bit, that's the um, linguistic breakdown of words by looking at their earlier original roots. Omni is all. And uh, from Latin, scientia means knowledge. That's where the word science comes from. So omniscient would be having all knowledge, correct. And so God is thought of as a being which knows and which has knowledge, but the belief is not just that he's knowledgeable of some things and not others, that some things could be unknown to God and that he would somehow be unaware of them. No, it is said that God knows everything from the smallest details to the biggest possible aspects of everything in the reality. He knows everything that has, will, and is happening. So God has perfect knowledge and all power. He's also thought of as, let's see, infinitely good. Exactly, Sophia. So um, the word for that is omnibenevolent. <clears throat> Benevolent, good, all, omni, all. So all good. All good in the moral sense, right? So if you had a being that was just completely powerful and had all the knowledge, but the being was sadistic and evil, uh, and that wouldn't be the God that we think of existing. God is supposed to be a force, but it's a moral force, a force of goodness and light. So God's goodness is supposed to be unlimited in its nature. He's not just good to some degree, but then there's something else that could be even better but that God represents the absolute perfection of, of goodness in every possible way. That's part of him being perfect. And then finally, the one last one, I see some kind of talking about it um, present everywhere, Sierra, very good. Um, eternity, Rachel, I see you saying that. And um, Cameron and Sierra, you're actually just using the word itself later in the chat, which is great. So omnipresent is, is the fourth and last major quality that I want to focus on anyway for this discussion. Um, omnipresent means all present. So all present, what does that mean? Um, existing at all places and at all times. So those that are saying immortal and eternal, it's folded into omnipresent because to be immortal and eternal means that you exist at all times. There's no time that God does not exist at. So he exists now, in the past, and in all times in the future. Uh, unlike a, a mortal human being uh, or something finite, which only exists for a limited amount of time and space. God is thought of as a being who is at all times and at all places. That he's not just like me and you located in one place but not at others. But that God in some sense is suffused throughout the entire uh, manifold of reality and that he's everywhere and all the time. Okay, good. So with these qualities, all powerful, all knowing, all good, all present, this is just part of the common everyday conception that one has when they think of God. And Anselm brings that up to our attention in his writing. He says, we all believe that the idea of God is the idea of, he summarizes these points, and he summarizes them up to basically mean the greatest conceivable being. That's what he thinks basically is derived from the summation of all these qualities. The greatest conceivable being. When you consider a being that is unlimited in power, knowledge, goodness, and presence, you're thinking of a being that's great but to the maximum level. So the greatest conceivable being. Conceivable means what you could possibly even think of in your head. So Anselm's first move in his argument is to draw to the reader's attention that God is believed to be the greatest conceivable being. Um, because he's believed to exist having these types of qualities. Like, he's believed to have those types of attributes. Now, um... <clears throat> Here's the next question. He says, who is it that has this understanding of the idea of God? The idea that God is the greatest conceivable being. Which type of individual do you think he's mentioning when he says God is believed to be the greatest conceivable being? Maybe you would be surprised by his response here, but I want to see what you think. So 
what type of individuals do you say he thinks, believes God is the greatest conceivable being? God's the greatest conceivable being, but according to who? What do you think is the answer to that question that he's posing? God is believed to be the greatest conceivable being, but in the minds of who? Okay, Sierra, so you say theists, yes. Certainly theists understand the idea of God to be the greatest conceivable being. Brooklyn, you say the same thing. Dewey, believers in God. But here there's a little, um, there's a little surprise in a way. He actually says that it's not just the theists. It's also even, who else? that at least has this idea of God, whether they believe in him or not, even who defines God as the greatest conceivable being. So what I'm trying to show you or trying to help you understand, bring out, is that he doesn't actually say that it's only theists. He, yes, he says even atheists have the same understanding of God. The difference between the theist and the atheist is not about the definition they place with the idea of God. The, dif the, the difference between the theist and the atheist is whether they what? Whether they think what about God? Not whether they think of God as the greatest conceivable being, but whether they actually think if God what? Yeah, whether they believe he exists. Exactly. So the theist believes God exists and is real. The atheist doesn't think so. But one thing they can at least shake hands on and agree to is that the idea in the mind of God is the same idea, right? And he wants that to be very, very clear. He says, you don't have to be a theist to understand what I'm talking about when I'm using the word terminology, God. An atheist who hears the word God, they know full well at least what I'm trying to talk about, that I'm talking about the idea of a greatest conceivable being. So he thinks, therefore, that all human beings have the same general conception of God, and the differences between people on this is in whether they believe in God or not, not whether they think of the same definition. So to an atheist, the word God means greatest conceivable being. Same with a theist. They don't disagree on the meaning of the word. And that's a key part of his argument. So let me just recap where we got so far. Anselm starts off and he says, what is God believed to be? Okay, question, answer. He's believed to be the greatest conceivable being because he's believed to have all those powerful features. So, who thinks of God as the greatest conceivable being? Um, maybe it's a surprise, maybe it's a plot twist to you, but he says, actually, if you think about it, it's not really um, too controversial that everybody has the same common understanding of God as the greatest conceivable being. So the atheist, Trong, I see you're saying they know he exists but don't believe in him. He doesn't quite say that. He, well, <laughs> we'll, we'll get, that's a tricky question in a way, but what he's essentially saying is, they may claim that they don't believe in him, but they at least understand the idea of him. Like they understand the concept of God. For example, you understand the idea of some things that you don't think are real, like fictional characters from film and uh, fiction. Um, so understanding the concept of something is a different question as to whether you really believe it exists. But he just wants to place on the table one uh, point of agreement that we can understand in common the meaning of the word. And if we can at least understand the concept, then he can move on to the next point in his discussion. Okay. In fact, let me read this to you. These are the words of Anselm himself, okay? So I try to describe these words in an everyday modern way of explaining it. Of course, when I read this stuff from a thousand years ago, it's going to sound a little bit more complicated, but... What we've described here is exactly what he has said in other words. So here we go. He says, beginning on page 15, he starts off this little section addressing himself to God. So he says, well then, Lord, you who give understanding to faith, grant me that I may understand as much as you see fit, that you exist as we believe you to exist, and that you are what we believe you to be. So he's addressing himself to God in that first part. He says, God, you know, um, you give understanding to me. So allow me to understand that you exist um, and that you are what we think you are. And now he goes on. He says, now we believe that you are something than which nothing greater can be thought. Let me make a point about the language here. Okay? 
Okay. See this phrase, the greatest conceivable being? That's the most, I think, easy way to say that in English. But for whatever reason, he often uses a slightly different turn of phrase, which means the same thing. And since it's kind of a tongue twister way of putting it, I want to make sure it's not confusing to you. So in the book, he keeps on referring to this as the being than which none greater can be conceived. So he kind of prefers this way of putting it, that God is generally thought of as the being than which none greater can be conceived. This adds a comparative. God is the being than which none greater can be conceived. So to conceive a being greater than God, none can be. None greater than God can be conceived. I think that it makes it a little less confusing to say and to read and write to just say greatest conceivable being. So don't get thrown off. When I read the passage and I quote him saying, you are thought to be the being than which none greater can be conceived. Just know that beneath that complex way of phrasing it, all he's saying is we think of you as the greatest possible thing we could ever think of. Okay, so now back to the text. He says, <clears throat> now we believe that you are something than which none, nothing greater can be thought or can it be that a thing of such a nature does not exist since, and now he quotes from the scripture, this passage from Psalms, where it says, the fool has said in his heart there is no God. So he says, can it be that a thing of such a nature does not exist since, quote, the fool has said in his heart there is no God, unquote. But surely, and now this brings us back to what I just mentioned, but surely when this same fool hears what I am speaking about, namely, something than which nothing greater can be thought. He understands what he hears. And what he understands is in his mind, even if he does not understand that it actually exists. Because it is one thing for an object to exist in the mind, and another thing to understand that an object actually exists. Okay? So I'm going to clear the board to create space for some new notes on the same subject. What we're going to do next is talk a little bit about um, things that exist in only the mind. And on the other hand, things that exist in the mind, but also in the real reality too. Okay. okay. So I'm just going to create a little table here to divide the two categories. Up here on the top left quadrant of this cross, I'm writing um, exists only in the mind. On the top right um, section here, I'm going to label it exists in both the mind and in reality. Okay. Now, help me out if you can. Let's think of some things that are over here on this side of the divider. Think, if you can, of some things. Some of you have already, I guess, given some examples, which are great, but things that exist, but they're only in the mind and they're not actually real things. Alexandra, you say our conscious, like our consciousness? Well, I don't know. Um, your consciousness, like your ability to perceive and feel and experience and have mental activity, um, I mean, your brain is real. Your brain is a real physical object, so the brain activities uh, are real. So I don't know. If consciousness is thought of as the existence of the cognitive brain synapses and neurons firing, then I would say that it does have a real-world basis also to go together with the mental aspect of it. Um, let's see. 
Brooklyn, you saying, is he saying it's possible to know who God is even if someone didn't hear what he is from other humans? Not so, well, the point he's just making is that some things exist only in the mind and there's some things that exist in the mind and in reality. After he discusses the difference between those kind of things, he's going to come back to his argument and say that if you're really the greatest thing that anyone could imagine, you'd have to be in both. But I want to continue filling out these examples for a minute. So um, your guys' examples are so philosophical and, and deep, but they're kind of almost a little weird because of that. Like someone says pride. Well, pride is a psychological state that a person can be in. It's like an emotional state kind of. I'm proud of my son for, you know, finishing top of his class in college or something. Um, but the existence of the chemical base, there's chemicals and so on that are released from the brain uh, and the dopamine and stuff that is circulating through the brain when those trans neurotransmitters are activated is kind of the physical and real cor correlative to the, to the mental experience of pride. Uh, do we, you say aliens? Well, about aliens, though, maybe they're out there. I don't know. If they, if they don't exist, then that would be a good example. But if they do exist, and how are we able to really uh, confirm from our current position in space and time whether they do or not? So I'd like an example of something that is known to not exist, not something that is of questionable existence or non-existence. Um, okay, Santa Claus is a very – that's like a good example. Okay, so like Santa Claus is – not a real being, although there was St. Nicholas, so that's also a little confusing, but the, you know, the, the legendary mythical Santa Claus who delivers everyone gifts and lives in the North Pole and stuff, that's something that exists only in the mind. So now you kind of get what I'm asking, like things, beings, right, but that they're not real, okay, only in the mind. Now, Red Panda, when you're saying food, come on, man, there's food everywhere. I could run to my fridge right now and pull some out. It's not just in my head. It's definitely real. Um, let's see. Light, time, those are definitely real. This room's got light on right now. I mean, there's light coming out of the light bulb. Light propagates through space somewhat like a photon, somewhat like a wave, but photons of light are real things. Um, superstition, laws, and on and on and on. Okay, I like the example of unicorn because it's uncontroversially something that does not exist. A lot of you guys are giving examples of things that a person could make an argument, at least, that it does really exist. And I don't want it to be any kind of gray area case. So a unicorn is another kind of good example. Unicorn, the mythical creature that's a horse with like a protruding horn from its forehead is just a thing of fiction. It's not actually real. We could think of it. Right now you are thinking of it. But it's only in your head. It's not outside of your head out there in reality. So book characters, yes, Brooklyn, if you would name one, like Harry Potter or, you know, um, any fictional character um, that's not a real person. Tooth Fairy, Bigfoot, fine, you know, those are all good. Okay, and I mean, we could go on and on and on. Um, but now I hope you understand the basic genre of things that fit this column. Someone says ghosts. I would agree, you know, being a person who's skeptical of the existence of uh, ghosts. But if there are people out there that think there's some reality to the concept of a ghost, I don't want to weigh in against their view. Here are things that I think 100% of us can agree are not really real. Loch Ness Monster, La Llorona, Easter Bunny, they're all good examples. Centaur. Okay, good, good, good. So you guys understand then he makes this point. Some things they don't really exist out there. We think about them, but they're just in our mind, and they're not really real outside of the mind. Now, over here on this side of the column, this is going to be almost like a funny exercise, because what I'm asking you here is give me some examples of things that are in the mind, but they're also real. You know, So like something that you sitting there can think of right now, but it's not just your, in your head. It's also outside of your head in the objective reality. That should be easy to come up with examples of, because it's like everything. It's like everything around you. So... Uh, Chicken nuggets, sure. Another student said food, which is a little more broad. So I like having a specific thing. So yeah, chicken nuggets. Think of those. Are they real? Yes, they do exist in the actual reality. You give the example of me, Dr. Foolish. Yeah, um, I'm not just a figment of your imagination. Uh, I'm a real flesh and blood human being. 
So when you're not thinking about me, I'm, I'm still existing, okay? Um, Harry Styles, money, and on and on, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, my cat, that's another one. Come on, Eddie, I'm trying to learn too much. Get out of here, be a cat. Yeah. <clears throat> um, let's see. Yeah, like, I don't know, a computer, dinosaurs. Dinosaurs is a good example because although they no longer exist, they've gone extinct, they did exist. And so it's not like something that is always permanently relegated to the realm of fiction or imagination. Okay, and we could say more stuff, you know, like public objects I think are sometimes good because they're very particular, like uh, White House, Eiffel Tower, Grand Canyon, you know, whatever. There's lots of stuff. That's real. Okay, now, wizards. No, nah, man, no, not, not wizards. Let's not get lost in the sauce. So um, with this graph on the table now, here's what we're saying. Some things exist only in the mind. Some things exist in the mind and in reality. But here's the question now. Which of the two kinds of things do you think would be greater? Is it greater to exist just only in the head or in the mind and in reality too. Like one of those two things is greater than the other. The things that are really real or the things that are just fictional. What is greater? Existing both in mind and reality or only the mind? That's the question. Would it be greater to exist in the mind and reality or just the mind? Yes, AJ, both. It's greater to exist in both because that's more than one. If a thing exists in the mind, okay, cool. But if it exists in the mind and in reality, that's existing in more ways than just one. So what Anselm says to you next is, although there are some things that are just merely in the mind, and there are other things that are in mind, but plus they're in reality, it would be greater to exist in both. And now let's go back to our original discussion of the definition of God. God was defined as... What kind of being, again, if you can remember? God was thought of as the which kind of being, according to this author? Hey, <laughs> So cute. Yeah, greatest conceivable being. So if he's the greatest conceivable being, then he has to exist in both the mind and in reality. Good to see you, Abraham. Yeah, because if you only existed in the mind, you'd fail to be as great as you possibly could be. But God's the greatest conceivable being. So based on his definition alone, he has to exist in both. And that would mean that he actually is real. Okay, so let me read as he describes it himself. So where we left off in the text last time, he says, When the fool hears what I'm speaking about, something that nothing greater can be thought, he understands what he hears. And what he understands is in his mind even if he does not understand that it actually exists. Because it is one thing for an object to exist in the mind, and another thing to understand that an object actually exists. So he gives this example of a painter who is thinking of a painting at first, but didn't paint it yet. Okay, so he says thus, when a painter plans beforehand what he is going to execute, he has the picture in his mind, but he does not yet think that it actually exists because he has not yet painted it. But when he has painted it, when he's finished the work, now it's both in his mind, because he can think about it anywhere, but it's also out there in reality on the canvas. He's made it real. So he says, however, when he has actually painted it, then he both has it in his mind and understands that it exists because he has now made it. So here's the key point. He says, even the fool then, which when he says fool, it's his, I don't know, cute way of uh, labeling the, the so-called atheist, right? So he's using the scripture from Psalms, the fool said in his heart, there's no God. Even the fool then is forced to agree that something then which nothing greater can be thought exists in the mind, right? So he returns to the point that we've already established that for even an atheist, God at a minimum exists in the mind because they understand the term and they understand the concept. So they can't deny that it's at least something that they can think of. So he says, even the fool is forced to agree that something when, than which nothing greater can be thought exists in the mind, since he understands that when he hears it, and whatever is understood is in the mind. And surely, that than which a greater cannot be thought cannot exist in the mind alone, 
Because if it exists only in the mind, it could be thought to exist in reality also, which is greater. So, if that than which a greater cannot be thought exists in the mind alone, this same that than which a greater cannot be thought is that than which a greater can be thought, but this is obviously impossible. Therefore, there's absolutely no doubt that something than which a greater cannot be thought exists both in the mind and in reality. So that is his essential argument for the existence of God. And let me just summarize it to you one more time. There's a little more still to say about it, but I'm going to try and make sure it's clear at every point. So he starts by saying, what is the idea of God, at least? It's the idea of the greatest conceivable being. And he says, that's an idea that we all can have in our mind in common. Some of us. But even if you don't, you can still understand the concept that's being described when people talk about God. So everyone, theists, atheists alike, have the idea of the greatest conceivable being. Okay, well, some things exist only in the mind, and some things exist in the mind and in reality. So as he pursues this argument, his next question to you is, what kind of being is God? Is God more like, you know, the tooth fairy or... You know, the unicorn or Santa, something that people think about and talk about and have an idea of, but it's just in their head and it's not really real. Is it like that? Or is God more like these sorts of things? Something that is in the mind, but it also has reality outside of the mind. So it's actually a real thing objectively. His argument then concludes that because it's greater to exist in both the mind and in reality, God has to then exist in both. Why? because God is the greatest conceivable being by definition. And if he didn't exist in both mind and reality, then he wouldn't live up to the definition which we already have established. So this is an argument for God's existence, which is kind of based on the general definition or idea of God. He's arguing that the idea of God is something so great that if it wasn't really real, then it would violate the perfection of the idea. God, as the greatest conceivable being, has to exist because not existing is less perfect, less great than to exist, both in mind and in reality. Um, so the method of argument that he's using here, and now I'm going to talk about that, is what is sometimes in logic and philosophy called reductio ad absurdum. <clears throat> So a very famous and well-known method of logical argument that is sometimes employed is the one that he's using here called reductio ad absurdum. Sorry, Eddie. Good boy. Okay, yeah, so reductio ad absurdum. This comes also from Latin originally, and in Latin the phrase would mean something like to reduce to absurdity. The method of reductio ad absurdum is you assume the opposite of what you would like to prove just for the sake of argument, and then you try to show that that would lead to something um, contradictory or absurd, and that shows that your original claim is in fact true. So... <clears throat> I'll write it down here. The method goes as follows. Assume the opposite of what you would like to prove. And then show uh, that this would lead to something absurd or impossible. It would lead to something absurd or contradictory. So the method of reductio ad absurdum is like you have a position that you're defending and to prove it, you, for the sake of argument, assume that the opposite of your claim is true. And then you try to demonstrate that if this contrary assumption were true, that it would logically imply something that is ridiculous, absurd, or impossible. 
which thus proves your original position. For example, um, take the case of the Earth being a sphere. It is a sphere. At least I would hope that that's something we don't have any disagreement about. But um, suppose that someone's engaged with some, uh, some flat earther, and they want to try and show that the Earth's, it's not flat. Okay, so if you're using reductio ad absurdum, and your argument goal is to show the Earth is not flat, then what would be your first move in doing reductio ad absurdum? Remember, you're trying to affirm and argue that it is not flat. So in the method of reductio, first step would be to temporarily assume that what? We're trying to show the Earth's not flat by reductio. And therefore we say, okay, so assume that what? Assume it is flat. Good. So let's say it's flat, hypothetically, just for the sake of argument. We don't, this, this is not what I really believe, but let's say the Earth wasn't round. If the Earth was flat... Can you tell me anything that would be ridiculous or absurd that would be implied by that? If, in fact, it was flat. If we say the world is flat, then what ridiculous or absurd conclusions would follow from that? If it was really flat, that would mean this ridiculous stuff. Now you tell me what those ridiculous, absurd things would be. That things would fall off the edge of the Earth, correct. Uh, if the Earth was flat then the entire surface of the earth would be illuminated in light by the same source of light because you can only explain some parts of the earth being bathed in sunlight and not others on the assumption that it's a rotating sphere with one surface exposed to the sunlight and not the other. If the earth was flat, then there would be no way to explain the existence of all the photographs taken from orbiting satellites and from the moon, uh, which clearly show that it's a sphere. So there's a lot of ridiculous and absurd things that would be implied by the Earth being flat. Therefore, it's not flat. Okay, so see what I did there? My goal was to show it's not flat. So I assume, you know, say it was flat. If it was, things would fall off the edge. But that's ridiculous, and that's not what happens, and so it is not flat. In other words, it is a spirit. Now, in the case of Anselm, Anselm's goal is to show that uh, God does not only exist in the mind. It's not that he's only in your head like Santa Claus. That's his goal, that he's not just a mental fiction of your imagination. In reductio ad absurdum, if your goal was to show that God does not only exist in the mind, you would make the temporary assumption that, let's assume what? Assume that God what? Keep in mind the method of reductio. The goal, to show that he's not only in your mind. So by reductio, we would assume for the sake of argument Suppose that he's what? Suppose God were to only be what? Yes, we know all the weird, ridiculous things about the supposition that the earth is flat, but suppose that God only exists in the mind, yes. If a God only existed in the mind, like Santa Claus, what would be the uh, contradiction there? In that case, he would not be the what? If God only existed in the mind, just repeating the argument again, then he would not be the greatest conceivable being, exactly. Because things that only exist in the mind are not as great as things that exist in the mind and in reality. So if God only existed in the mind, he wouldn't be the greatest being. But that's his definition. So clearly, he's not only in the mind, but he's in the mind and in reality, exactly. So although I'm trying to give you all the big details of the argument, the essential line of argument itself is, I find, not too hard to master. All he is saying is, God is known by all people, whether you're an atheist or a theist, to be the greatest conceivable being. That's at least the definition of the word. And um, some things only exist in the mind, and some things exist in the mind and in reality. So like, there are things like unicorns, but then there's also the White House or the Eiffel Tower. Question, is God only in the mind, like the unicorn or you know, the tooth fairy or a dragon? Or is God more like the objects and things that are also outside of your mind in the real universe? He says, well, he has to be in both the mind and in reality. Because it's greater to exist in both the mind and in reality. And if he was only in the mind, then he would not satisfy the definition of God that we started with, which is greatest conceivable being. 
So if the greatest conceivable being was only in the mind, he wouldn't be the greatest conceivable being, but that's illogical. So he must really exist. Why? Because if he didn't, he wouldn't be as great as the greatest thing. To exist is one element of being great. So anything that's not really real can't be the greatest conceivable being. So look at this. The whole argument is derived from the definition of God. God thought of as the greatest conceivable being must really exist because failure to exist in the mind and in reality is to be less than fully perfect and great. Now, as we go through the argument, there's a little more to say, but that's the main thrust of the argument. Like, that's the core of the argument right there. So if you understood that part, good. That means that you really did get the main uh, point of today's meeting and lecture. But let me add the last little points that he mentions in the back page. So the second little part of his paper here, on page 16, he has a new... Says the greatest conceivable being can't be only in the mind, otherwise it would be less than perfect. But on top of that, he also wants to try and argue that God cannot even be thought not to exist. Okay, so now think about that. He's saying God is so great that not only does he have to exist, but he also cannot even be thought not to. Why is he saying that? Well, he says it for the same type of reason that he already gave about God's existence. He says, if a being can be thought not to exist, like if you can have a thought in your mind of a being not existing, then that being is less perfect than another being who cannot be thought not to exist. Okay. Now, I understand that the way that he's talking and writing here gets us into some confusing language because there's a lot of double negatives. God cannot be thought not to exist. But that's what he's driving at. God is so great that the thought that he doesn't exist is not even possible to think. So he's trying to argue now that the greatest conceivable being would not be the greatest conceivable being if he could be thought of as not existing. So in other words, he's too great for you to even think he doesn't exist. He can't be thought to not exist. Okay, so let me read this. He says this on the page 16. Certainly, this being so truly exists that it cannot be even thought not to exist because something can be thought to exist that cannot be thought not to. And this is greater than that which can be thought not to exist. Hence, if that then which a greater cannot be thought can be thought not to exist, then that then which a greater cannot be thought is not the same as that then which a greater cannot be thought, which is absurd. Something than which a greater cannot be thought exists so truly then that it cannot be even thought not to exist. And then he talks to God, I guess, again for a minute. He says, and you, Lord God, are this being. You exist so truly, Lord God, that you cannot even be thought not to exist. And that is all as it should be. Because if some intelligence could think of something better than you, the creature would be above the creator and would judge the creator. And that is completely absurd. In fact, Everything else there is, except for you alone, can be thought of as not existing. You alone, then, of all things, most truly exist, and therefore of all things possess existence to the highest degree, because anything else does not exist as truly, and so possesses existence to a lesser degree. Why, then, did the fool say in his heart there is no God, when it is so evident to any rational mind that you of all things exist to the highest degree? Why, indeed, unless because he was stupid and a fool? Now, I, I don't... <laughs> I don't uh, concur with the language used there. You know, he's getting kind of heavy handed talking about the atheist as a stupid person and a fool. But really, he's just trying to lay it on kind of thick there. He's saying um, the idea that God does not exist cannot even be thought of because if it could be thought that God does not exist, that would detract from his greatness. And he's too great to even be thought of that way. And that's a little interesting because what he's saying is God is unique among all beings because everything else can be thought of as not existing. Like, I don't know, take me as an example. Can I imagine myself not existing? Yes, a little disturbing, but uh, I can and do sometimes think about no longer existing in the future or before I was born, not having existed before that time. But he's saying God cannot be thought of as something that will cease to exist or at some prior time did not exist. Um, the idea of the greatest conceivable being prevents that thought from being possible. That thought can only be formed around things that lack utter perfection and greatness. Um, 
So does that make sense to you guys? Like two things have been established, he thinks. Um, and by the way, let's not forget the big picture. We're going to talk about a bunch of objections too. So if you're a student sitting there thinking, it's got to be a problem with this argument though, or I have a sense that there's something a little fishy about it, or I don't like the argument, or at least even if I believe in God, I wouldn't go with this way of making the case for it. Definitely you're going to hear a lot of stuff about objections and criticisms that others have raised. But we're focusing on the argument itself for now. So he's tried to show two things. Number one, God exists. Why? Because he's defined as the greatest conceivable being, and it's greater to exist than to not exist. So to be, a, to be the being that he is by definition, he has to really exist in the mind and in reality. If he was only in the mind, like, like the tooth fairy, then uh, he wouldn't be as great as something that's both in the mind and in reality. So the definition commits us to the claim that he exists in both. Furthermore, what's the second thing that he tries to show? I want you to tell me because it's such a tongue twister that I want the student to be able to, to clearly articulate it. So what is that secondary point that we just mentioned that he's trying to establish? Not only that God has to exist because he's defined as the greatest conceivable being, but furthermore, he tries to prove what about God? Second, one, number one, he exists. Number two, that God what? the second little point established here in the course of his argument. He thinks that God what? That second point. God exists, and also, because he's the greatest conceivable being, he cannot, well, close, Trung, you, uh, let me see, Brooklyn, he can't be thought to not exist, yes, exactly. It's not possible for one to think that he doesn't exist. So it's not, it, Sierra and, um, and Trong, you guys are talking about the claim that he must exist. Yes, that's the first point, though. The second point is very closely related to that, but it's just slightly different because it's about thinking whether he exists or not. So he wants to put that extra point on top of it, that not only must he exist, but he can't even be thought not to exist. And let me make sure everyone's got the same idea here. No one can... They can say he doesn't exist, but I guess they can't really think it, is his claim. Cannot be thought not to exist. Good. He can't be thought about as not existing. Okay, perfect. Good. So that leaves us with just one last little issue, and he tries to grapple with that at the end here in his final paragraph. So remember now, he just tried to make this case that God cannot be thought not to exist. And you might be then scratching your head wondering, well, if he's saying God cannot be thought not to exist, then what is an atheist? Because what is the definition of an atheist? An atheist, as we've learned, is a person who thinks God doesn't exist. But Anselm is saying that's not even possible. Anselm is saying it is impossible to think that God does not exist. So how then can he reconcile that with the evident existence of atheists? Do they not exist or do they have thoughts that are different from what they think they're thinking? Actually, that's what he does say. So he says to those that call themselves atheists and say of themselves, I think there's no God. Anselm replies to that type of person by saying, actually, no, you don't. You don't think there's no God. It's impossible for you to think there's no God. You think you think there's no God, but that's not what you actually have a thought about. So he has this kind of tricky little um, move here where he says, in fact, when the atheist says that statement or thinks those words, there's no God, they aren't even thinking about the real God. They must be substituting an idea of something inferior to God when they use the word. So that does not count as a thought that God does not exist. That is a thought that God does not exist, in quotes, because the God that is in the mind of the atheist can't be the real God, because the real God can't be thought of as not existing. You kind of understand what he's saying here? So the real idea of the atheist is that something uh, does not exist, but it's an idea of something other than God, even if they use the word God in their thought or in their speech. So it's like they're using a word but with the wrong meaning. Like if I'm holding this marker right here and I tell you, um, check out this dog, right? I'm using the word dog, but I'm not using it to refer to a dog. So just using a word in my speech or in my thought doesn't guarantee that the thing I'm referring to is that thing. So he says that when an atheist says, I don't believe in God, they're not really thinking about the actual God. They're thinking about something else and using the word God 
but they're not thinking of the real being. So let me read here his words about that. He has to claim this because he's already committed himself to the view that there's no way to think God doesn't exist. So instead of saying that atheists really think that, he has to re-describe what they believe as a thought that uh, presents itself as being about God, but it's really about something completely different. So here's what he says. He says, how indeed has he said in his heart what he could not think? Like the, the, the fool that says there's no God. How could he say that when he can't think it? Or how could he not think what he said in his heart? Since to say in one's heart and to think are the same. But if he really thought because he said in his heart and did not say in his heart because he could not think, then there is not only one sense in which something is said in one's heart or thought. Because in one sense, a thing is thought when the word signifying it is thought. In another sense, when the very object which the thing is, is understood. So in the first sense, then, God can be thought not to exist when you're just thinking about the not exist, but not in the second sense when you're thinking of the actual great being of God. No one, he says, understanding what God is, can think that God does not exist, even though he may say those words either with no meaning or with a different meaning, because God is that than which nothing greater can be thought. And whoever really understands this understands clearly that this same being so exists that not even in thought, not even in the mind, can it not exist. So whoever understands that God exists in this way cannot think of him as not existing. He says, I give thanks, Lord. I give thanks to you since what I believed before through your free gift, I now understand through your illumination that if I did not want to believe that you existed, I would nevertheless be unable not to understand it. Okay, so that's how he concludes his piece of writing there. And let me see some of the comments that you've got in the chat. Um, yeah, so the real God is the mind itself, AJ? I, I don't know. Um, do you mean in the mind? Because the mind, I mean, like me and you are just finite like creatures on this planet and our minds are distinct from each other. You know, we've got our brain and our skull. Um, you can think of a thing, but it's not like literally part of the brain. Like I'm thinking right now of the great pyramids, but my mind just forms the image of those pyramids. It's not of course that the pyramid is the mind. Um, and so when he talks about God existing, he doesn't think of God as just being some mental construct. He thinks of God as having independent reality. Of course, God existed before everything else, if, if uh, you take traditional theism to be true, when there were no other minds at all. Um, Dante, good question. Is atheism contradictory? I guess according to Anselm, in a way, it's kind of an incoherent position because it's based around the idea of not believing in God. But according to Anselm, it's impossible to, to be in the position of not believing in God because he's too great to even be thought of as such. So I believe, according to Anselm, the atheist is a person who is confused about what's really going on in their own mind. They assume they're thinking of God when they have these beliefs about his non-existence. But actually, they aren't even thinking of God when they make those statements. That's what he says, anyway. Um, but I, me, personally, I find that to be an odd position because, I mean, didn't he start the whole article by saying everyone understands the idea of God, atheist and theist alike? Uh, but then later on, when it becomes inconvenient to say that the atheist understands the idea of God, because that would make it such that they do think he doesn't exist, he uh, contradicts that in a way and says, no, they didn't even have the idea, at least not when they professed to disbelieve. Um, oh, you say the mind controls us to believe in what is true or not. But aren't you the first person? I mean, you, you are the mind that you are talking about, are you not? Um, so don't you have a will, a free will, uh, which controls the judgments and actions that the mind undertakes? Well, that's a heady question. I guess I can't weigh in and answer it with the only have two minutes left. Um, what is my opinion on the argument? Well, I think that this is a good question, and we'll close with this because I know we're running close on time. But I think that there are very good and clever arguments for God's existence that are better than this one. Um, it does have some appeal. You might think there's this unique idea of God. It's not like any other idea. It's the idea of something that's greater than anything else I can imagine. And if you really have that kind of, um, if you find that to be a very unique and distinctive um, idea in your mind, then this view, this argument might appeal to you. I personally think that it strikes me as kind of a little too much, making too much of a definition. Like starting with a definition of a word 
and then using that to try and make bigger claims about what exists in the reality. Something about that just strikes me as not the most effective argument. So it, me personally, I prefer the second argument that we'll get to next week, which is the cosmological argument. That's, I think, the best high-quality argument for God's existence. And it basically just says that since the universe exists and since something cannot come from nothing, then there had to be a cause of the universe. But whatever the cause of the universe is cannot clearly be a part of the universe or else it would have had to huh, uh, exist before itself, which is impossible. So there must be something that is independent and different from the universe which can serve to cause it, to bring it into being. Um, and that is God. So there's an interesting argument there because I think we all do understand cause and effect and that when something exists, it has some prior cause before it. If the whole universe is the thing that we're now asking about its origins, uh, then you, you can't find the origins within the system, but somehow outside and over and beyond it. I find that to be the most powerful argument for God's existence, but I'm just one man and everyone's judgment is, is fair and ind individual. So we'll get through these remaining arguments. There's criticisms of this that I haven't talked to you yet about. So on Tuesday, when we return, come back at 5.30 on Tuesday, I'll be at the same place on these YouTube live links and we'll go further with the ontological argument and we'll just continue with philosophy of religion for a few weeks before I give you guys the prompt for the first essay. All right, everyone, thank you so much. I don't wanna keep you any longer, so just have a great night. Um, stay safe, healthy, and uh, take care. And if you have any questions or anything else, do email me. All right, guys, take care, bye-bye, have a good weekend.